Yes, as Einer said, uh, I'm an assistant professor here at, at Virginia Tech. We are a large uh, American style land grant university out in Southwest Virginia, a very rural uh, part of the uh, Appalachian Mountains, um, the Blue Ridge Mountain Range um, here somewhere kind of in the middle Atlantic uh, towards the South. And uh, I'm also core faculty in this interdisciplinary PhD program, um, which the acronym ASPECT is, is stands for the Alliance for Social, Political, Ethical, and Cultural Thought, uh, kind of a boutique uh, interdisciplinary PhD program, um, which I think much like a, the department um, that uh, you all uh, share in common uh, is, um, uh, is a program that strives to clearly ground our students in disciplinary concerns, questions, and methods, but towards perhaps questions that the disciplines themselves don't um, really uh, uh, bother to engage with most of the time. So uh, for me as a student uh, coming out of a disciplinary program, it was very frustrating uh, uh, a lot of the time. And it was quite frustrating to do the project that I'm going to talk um, with you about today, uh, both as I was figuring out what that project was going to be, uh, as well as I was trying to write it in a way that would appeal to American political scientists uh, in spite of the richness of the secondary literature and indeed the primary um, sources that I was working with. So um, it, it's, it's really, uh, it's great. I'm thrilled to be here uh, knowing Einar all these years and, and anxiously awaiting and discussing the opportunity to, to visit Oslo, which of course I wish I were doing now. Um, uh, 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 be doing this in person as opposed to doing this via Zoom. Nevertheless, I wanna thank uh, Professor Whit Viggen, uh, Professor Helga Jordheim, and Ingrid Eskild for um, their generosity and their work um, in the lead up today. And of course, I want to thank all of you for choosing to, to be here your Friday uh, afternoon. Um, so on that note, uh, let me share, I'm going to do the proverbial um, sharing of screens uh, that happens these days. Bear with me as I figure out um, which is the right screen I should be sharing. Okay, that one, this one. Okay, and can folks basically just see the title slide? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm just going to go ahead um, and go with it. And as I mentioned uh, to Ingrid and Einer um, prior to folks coming into the room, um, I'm not going to talk very long. I'm going to talk for a few minutes in providing some of the scope of the project, uh, as well as it discuss some of its origins. It, and there's ample time for questions and answers. And, and I do have other, uh, you know, uh, slides in the deck to talk about illustrations. I have lots of images. Uh, from the book and, and images that didn't make it into the book um, to kind of dig a little bit into some of the case studies that the book uh, wrestles with, as well as just the questions that I engage with in the, the opening, uh, the first chapter and the epilogue, which, which I hope you all had a chance to at least um, skim uh, as you were uh, in preparation for um, today. So um, it's common here in the United States uh, to begin with acknowledgements, right? So um, the first acknowledgement that I wanna begin with is you all may have noticed uh, that this book has been made freely available um, in an open access edition, uh, thanks to the generous support of Virginia Tech and an initiative that we have here on campus called the Toward an Open Monograph Ecosystem. Um, that's TOME, T-O-M-E, uh, which uh, provided a, a substantive um, subvention grant to the press that allowed for the book to be published, not just you know in nice hard copies and paperback copies, but also basically freely um, on the publisher's page, as well as um, through other repositories, JSTOR, our own uh, library repository here at Virginia Tech. And, and that I think as a young scholar um, makes a huge difference to reach uh, a global audience, but also uh, I think just uh, uh, to really challenge some of the um, less uh, favorable academic capitalist tendencies that we face in the American Academy at least. Um, so I wanna start with that. Uh, the second one, acknowledgement I wanna make, which is, perhaps an acknowledgement that at least on my end of the Atlantic has become um, quite a norm, and that is uh, a land acknowledgement. Uh, so uh, here, especially in land-grant universities, um, we begin talks such as this by acknowledging the dispossession of indigenous lands. And in this case, I wanna acknowledge the uh, Tutalamonican peoples um, of this part of the Appalachian Mountains who are the traditional custodians on the land on which at least here on this side of the Zoomscape, um, I work uh, in and I live on and to recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that this institution, Virginia Tech, and those of us who are um, part of this institution consume for our nourishment and our well being. We pay respect to the Tutalamonican nations and to their elders, past, present, and emerging, to all of the women, men, and children whose actions precede our own works and whose memories we hope will outlast us well beyond when we are gone. 
So as I mentioned, um, and as some of you may know, uh, land acknowledgements have become a central feature of the commitment uh, to a culture of inclusion and respect uh, that begins with those who were here first and, and whose continued presence is important to our future. For some, uh, certainly academics, recognition is vital, um, regardless of whether indigenous peoples have legal ownership of the land on which an event is taking place. For others, however, like myself, uh, recognition that land, culture, practices, ideals for the future are regularly taken and appropriated in surreptitious ways is central to the claims I make in this book. This is not only because the relationship of indigenous peoples to their traditional countries incorporates more than just ownership or occupation of the land, but also because the complex histories of colonization incorporate more, uh, the complex histories of colonization across the Americas have had devastating effects on indigenous peoples. Acknowledgements such as this one um, are practices that promote awareness of and respect for indigenous culture, but they're also practices that end the broader histories of silence and exclusion that have resulted in the systematic disadvantaging of indigenous peoples um, today. And I can only mostly speak for my context um, uh, uh, in the Americas, but, but I think where you are in Norway, um, you all probably uh, uh, have a richer uh, understanding of that than many of my colleagues here um, uh, in the American Academy um, do, uh, for better or for worse, right? Um, so uh, in the book that I'm here to talk about today, Writing the World, The Politics of Natural History in the Early Spanish Empire, uh, I actually examine a broader set of narratives and ideals that made possible that culture of exclusion. At the book's heart is the reconstruction of a period and series of episodes which themselves have been largely erased from conventional readings in the history of political thought, readings which, in my view, make up a cascading series of omissions, omissions that distort the scholarly understanding of how the Americas, the New World, Tahuantinsuyo, Tenochtitlan, Turtle Island, or whatever name the previous inhabitants of these lands across the hemisphere had for the riches that lie therein. The book is a product of almost a decade thinking through the issues outlined above, but also questions that span the history of ideas, the history of religion and evangelization, the history of imperial science, and the wide array of demons past and present that haunt the efforts to make sense and make meaning out of the incommensurable and the different. To that end, there are many devils in this book. Chief among them is the challenge posed to political theorists to take seriously the intellectual contributions of early modern Spanish and Spanish American thinkers in their efforts to make sense of nature and the peoples of the Americas at the dawn of modernity. More the result of omission than commission, Misleading narratives about Spanish America or Latin America today produced by members of the early modern canon still retain a significant hold over the ways in which political concepts, debates, and exemplary names of the 16th century are defined. As someone highly indebted to that same corpus, I was trained as a political theorist, a historian of European political thought. And I have written this book in order to broaden the horizons of that field and rethink its political contours. But like many countless post-colonial thinkers, I endeavor here also to convey how historical domination is not only composed of epic conquests, like the conquest of Tenochtitlan, but is also reproduced, even if inadvertently, via scholarly work. And here, a, a plug, uh, as Einer said, to the, the work that he and I are, are, are engaged in in interlingual relations is precisely an effort uh, towards unpacking that same kind of uh, linguistic domination uh, that occurs through scholarly work, and especially scholarly work with, with kind of the hegemony of the American Academy in many, though not all, uh, uh, scholarly conversations. But back to the book. Um, specifically, the kind of inquiries that I document in this book lie at the very heart of debates between the empirical and the theoretical foundations of early modern political thought, at least as it's understood within the canon of um, American or Anglophonic political science. That they happened, that these conversations happened at the other side of the known world at a time when Europeans were only beginning to contemplate the existence of literally unknown utopian spaces is a key part of the story I want to tell. Um, so what I wanna do for you today in the first few minutes of our time together is walk you through different components informing my central argument, which is in, a, in, in brief that, this, that 16th century Imperial Spain was not only the political and moral center of European imperialism, but also its scientific center. And yet what I wanna to add to that argument is that the only reason it is the political, moral, and certainly scientific center of Europe, at least that is described itself and many European historians describe it, is because of this complex relationship with its colonies and the way in which those colonial possessions not only shaped Spanish imperial identity and ideals, but also served as the laboratory for what would become 
the so-called Spanish Empire. As I will go on to show by describing the origins and trajectory of this project, the practice of natural history is central to the story. And, and not only because it wasn't a homogenous form of scientific storytelling, but also because it was a contentious field of narrative inquiry. And so in this regard, the illustrations that I unpack here will also point to a key feature of my broader uh, research agenda, which is what I'm calling the geopolitics of natural history. Uh, I'll close the sort of first part of my, of my comments um, with a few words on um, uh, cognate projects that follow uh, this book, uh, which I maintain show the profound historical roots of contemporary critiques of environmental governance, security, other things that perhaps those of you who work on the international relations side of things um, uh, may be familiar with. Uh, but also more broadly, uh, I wanna show how uh, case studies like these uh, reveal problems in the way that nature, security, governance are discussed by scholars, uh, uh, as well as drawing connections with contemporary Latin America. So there's a lot packed in uh, to what I do and what I want to talk about, but I'm hoping that by going through some of these basic portions, um, uh, there'll be plenty of room for conversation about possible ideas and, and future projects. So um, for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about kind of the argumentative claim at the center of the book and the trajectory of the idea. And then perhaps I'll stop there for some questions uh, and discussion. And then maybe we can talk a little bit more about the broader cases and future directions of, the, of, this, um, of this work. So um, just so you know, I'm not going to read off slides, uh, uh, but I, I put text on the slides so that as I'm talking, if folks feel uh, they want kind of a concrete referent, um, uh, as I kind of elaborate, uh, uh, these will be helpful ways of, of thinking through um, some of the broader uh, angles that I'm presenting. Uh, but I want to present kind of the two parts of the broader argumentative claim um, of, this, of this work. So using Spain's politics of natural history in the new world as my central object of analysis, this book argues that the study of nature in the new world was about the cultivation of wonder, more so than merely extractive utilitarian interests. <laughs> My aim is to show how the natural historical writings of chroniclers, explorers, and most notably missionaries help to lay out a distinct set of empirical foundations for modern political thought as these developed in the new world. Natural history, I maintain, was a contentious field of narrative inquiry and should be read today as a distinct genre of early modern political thinking. And so these two um, parts of the argumentative claim, um, as I will elaborate, um, are kind of where I began this project, as I began kind of reading through the literature and thinking about what was out there um, within the Anglophonic um, uh, uh, world of political theory, at least. And um, they'll evolve throughout the course of, uh, of the presentation, just as they evolved throughout the course of me writing first the dissertation, now quite a few years ago, and then as I was thinking through uh, the presentation and the argument of this book. So, um, but like, you know, any good, I think, historian, um, it's good to sort of cite our sources and, and I begin with at least where did I find kind of the question that I was interested in and, and how did I do that? And um, in the uh, American context, it's quite fascinating because I think like Einer was hinting at, um, there's certainly quite a familiarity with approaches that we would label as, yes, cultural studies, but also anthro history, uh, uh, different kind of immersive uh, techniques and literatures. And some of the subfields within American political science are actually quite good at cultivating that immersion, both linguistic as well as substantive historical into um, graduate education, right? Um, I have to confess, however, um, uh, American political science in political theory isn't very good at that. <laughs> um, and I say that not as any kind of denunciation of my, my graduate education. I had quite a great time. I learned quite a bit. Um, but there's a very clear limit to what, as a political theorist in the United States, you are, let's not say allowed to study, um, but certainly what's available within the kind of broader scholarly vernacular. And one thing that I discovered as somebody who was born in Latin America, as somebody who is a Spanish speaker by birth, um, even though my, my um, uh, learning of the English language happened almost simultane simultaneously, is that um, there isn't very much room to think in Spanish. And I say that both literally as well as kind of figuratively, right? And I'll say the first, I'll talk about the first part first and then the second part, right? Um, which is to say that um, uh, the kind of pressures of what graduate funding look like in the United States and the fact that American education has been so commodified to the point that a PhD, you know, technically costs uh, thousands upon thousands of dollars. And in fact, there is this uh, very unfortunate phenomenon in the United States of graduate students pursuing uh, master's or doctoral work while significantly indebting themselves, um, makes it so that um, 
the experience isn't one generally where you're sort of free to kind of learn and, and, and develop skills that you may already have or that you may want to pick up. And for those of us that do global, deep historical, immersive work, that means that you coming in with a second or a third language can make a huge difference in your ability to work through sources. That should be no news to all of you who, again, for better or for worse, um, have to use the English language in order to kind of, you know, communicate with at least some subset of the broader global kind of scholarly community, right? And again, no judgment on, on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? But that's a thing. A thing that surprisingly in the United States, um, you don't have to do. You could be a scholar of Spain, of Turkey, of Russia, and never set foot in any of these places, let alone learn any of the nuances of their languages. Uh, you might not be a very good scholar, <laughs> but you could still get a PhD and you could still get recognized within the American Academy as being able to offer some kind of, you know, um, subset of skills uh, or abilities that will then be good for X institution. I was not very satisfied with that, right? I wanted to do something that as, as an individual um, could somehow help me think about and reflect on my own experience first as an immigrant, uh, someone who is, who is clearly, uh, you know, not of indigenous origin, um, clearly more tied to European dominators than of, to indigenous peoples, and thinking about politics both in a broad, deep historical sense, but also in a kind of personal sense, in the way in which I was reflected or not in the things I was studying and the things that I um, wanted to study going further. And so two books that were incredibly central to my, um, my kind of training and my early education were, are, were the ones that I'm presenting here on the screen. The first, uh, Anthony Pagden's um, early work, The Fall of Natural Man, uh, and uh, to the right, uh, Charles C. Mann's uh, 1491, uh, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus, which is a kind of popular science, popular history type of book that blends together various amounts of um, archeological and linguistic uh, studies and information to try to kind of reconstruct a picture of what the new world, uh, the so-called new world of the Americas looked like prior to European arrival. And these texts, by the way, the fact that they're written by um, Anglophonic scholars in an Anglophonic language, right, could be read as a kind of limitation, but they offered for me at least a peek at something that was different. And that's something that, um, that I thought was needed in the scholarship on the history of political thought, which was just basically a reflection, right, on those differences and the ways in which encounters between different languages and cultures and realities helped us help thinkers in the 16th century create a world at the same time that it could help us today um, recreate, reconstruct different facets of those worlds. So my approach in this book um, is to address the interplay of actually three things that fall under the purview of the, those challenges around language and doing deep historical, archival, maybe even ethnographic work. And that's to address the interplay with it between empire, faith, and the experience of new world environments, natural environments um, in the 16th century, illustrating how different conceptions of nature shaped Imperial Spain's early efforts to cultivate a so-called new world civilization. And to do so, I focus on works that attended to the distinctive ecological character of the Americas, lending greater attention to how early naturalist writings shaped the intellectual context of Spain's New World Empire, namely how these writings fed back into kind of the European uh, uh, intellectual network and what kind of conversations did they generate in Europe as well as in the Americas. But I also focus on the kind of millenarian ethos that many of these writings composed by missionaries brought to the urgency of colonization. So um, by extension, uh, I demonstrate how spiritual wonder played a central role in making sense of the New World's exotic landscapes and peoples, and in trying to trace the influence of religious conviction on the study of natural history in the New World, my aim is to broaden the evidentiary basis for where we root the scientific revolution, and specifically how the scientific revolution is increasingly being rooted in matters of faith as much as in matters of politics or empiricism as traditionally defined. So I move in the book through two themes only cursorily engaged by political theorists. The history of conquest narratives is one and missionary nature writings is the other one. And by doing so, I seek to unravel a long denounced but tenacious historiographical prejudice that portrays the Spanish empire and therefore its colonial holdings as largely marginal features of modernity. And this goes back to the thing I said a few minutes ago about how um, 
uh, how difficult, if not impossible, it is to think in Spanish in the American Academy, because as I said before, literally, uh, you don't have to, there is no ethos or pressure to do so, but more figuratively and, and therefore um, uh, substantively, uh, the broad cultural racism that exists towards Latin America and South of the American border, and also this broad historiographical uh, bias that exists towards the Spanish empire uh, and therefore its broader holdings for a variety of you know, substantive reasons too, um, makes it really difficult to say, I wanna make Spain as the center of my analysis. And by extension, I wanna focus on the legacies, imperial legacies of, of Spanish rule in the Americas as a substantive political science project, right? And in political theory more so because of this obsession that we have in the field um, with liberalism and even in a critical vein, right? Um, something that some of you may be, may be familiar with as you've encountered um, uh, works in the Anglosphere. Okay. So again, right, a couple of sort of broad points and questions as to what and how I felt the idea as I was a student and then later as this became a book evolve, um, uh, even in a kind of controversial or contentious manner, uh, uh, there's very little question that 16th century Spain was an incredibly important uh, state power force network uh, composite monarchy, however you want to describe it, um, of the, of the so-called modern world. And yet this question of why there's so little engagement of it in political theory um, really bothered me, and particularly how there was and there had been a significant Anglophonic scholarship into the Spanish Empire well into maybe the early 2000s. And then all of a sudden, and I, and I have a suspicion that it's largely because 9-11 um, happened here in the United States, there's sort of a market cut and then people kind of stopped talking about Spain, even historians, as we all became kind of, you know, uh, Agambenians and, and became obsessed with, with the, 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 the moment of exception. But that's been different in the last few years. And so and in light of various historiographical advances in the study of colonial Spanish America and literature and cultural theory, um, I would venture to argue that this is the first work of political theory in almost two decades that attempts to account for new world exploration and evangelization as part of a dual science of domination. So there have been other works of political theory that really think and take seriously the conception of the Americas and how that fed into the new world. But none of those actually think of religion as a central part of that story. And I would venture that this is the first one in a while that tries to do that, although I'm open to, to being corrected. And so rather than portraying imperialism as a project forged from abroad in the center of Spain, I offer instead a more complex genesis of the imperial ideals that were proffered by the study of nature within the Americas. Natural history's deployment led to enduring literary motifs in the representation of the new world, as well as contentious depictions of a future colonial society. The case of Spanish natural history is thus, in my mind, a critical juncture in the relationship between science and empire. Driven, driven by religious wonder, scientific inquiry thrived. Yet, as the empire grew unwieldy, uh, the normative aspirations of naturalist thought were subsumed to more instrumentalist economic growth. Spanish experiences of nature in the early modern period helped to shape spiritual visions of the natural world. They offered an adaptive discourse for empire. They called for a new map on which the future of civilization could be written, but then they fell victim to the same geopolitical demands that most European empires fall victim to, which is expansion, growth, and uh, 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 pure material domination. Nevertheless, this vital period remains today a disputed space from which to convey the imperial politics of science, particularly as contemporary forms of environmental ethics, at least in the Anglophonics uh, context, rediscover indigenous writings and indigenous ways of relating to nature that reject romanticism and capitalist um, co-optations. Hence why um, in the book, as I, as I go through it, uh, 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 I question some of those motives and I think a lot more critically about, well, what does it mean if today we want to talk about um, indigenous ethics, indigenous cosmologies in our relationship to how we use the natural world, if we don't take seriously the question of decolonization and then this, and the question around domination um, through which uh, 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 science as we understand it today has been developing for 500 years. Okay, so in closing in this first part of my comments, um, this then is a story about faith as much as it is about nature in the first century of Spain's New World Empire. It aims at nothing less than providing the theoretical scaffolding to study this interplay of forces in light of a greater historiographical debate within the human sciences, what the historian Jorge Cañizares Esguerra calls writing the history of the New World. 
in comparing the efforts of scholarly, uh, the efforts of Spanish chroniclers, explorers, and missionaries to make sense of new world nature, I demonstrate that the natural histories they forged as part of their various efforts exerted a decisive influence on the intellectual climate of Spain, its colonies, and Europe. They also produced conflicts of interest between the Spanish crown and its colonial representatives. And as a historian of political thought, this juxtaposition between crown and colony helps me theorize Spain's empire in more varied ways, jettisoning the notion that Spanish rule operated singularly across various distinct territories. And going further, my analysis aims to substantiate the effects of new world nature on different Spanish uh, imaginaries. And so I'll, I'll just say that <laughs> this image, um, I, I, I very carefully uh, projected this image uh, when I was doing my interview uh, here uh, at this uh, at this university as an illustration for the fact that in political science, American political science, when we often use the word history, um, we use it in ways that I'm not really sure most people um, know, uh, or, or 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 they use it in ways that I'm not really sure people understand the meanings of how they're using it. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see all of you. And um, again, I want to thank you for this uh, uh, opportunity to have a conversation, and I look forward to any comments, critiques, or questions.